Hello, everyone. This week's episode with Mark Singleton is actually extracted from a larger discussion that is a part of our Yoga Reconsidered online conference, which you can sign up for presently at embodiedphilosophy.courses forward slash yoga reconsidered. Because this is a part of a larger talk, the entire discussion actually isn't included here. And you'll notice at the end that um, I it ends with me asking a question and then um, perhaps annoyingly for some of you, it ends right there. So if you want to hear the rest of the discussion, you'll have to sign up, register for our online conference starting uh, February 16th. Again, that's embodiedphilosophy.courses forward slash yoga reconsidered. Here's part of that conversation with Mark Singleton. Hello, everyone. I'm Jacob Kyle, and I'm here with Mark Singleton, scholar and author of Yoga Body and co-author of Roots of Yoga with James Mallinson. I'm here today at the Yoga Reconsidered online conference to discuss the evolution of Mark's work and also to address some of the misunderstandings and misinterpretations of Yoga Body and its conclusions that have become popular among non-academic audiences, particularly in the yoga community. So hello, Mark. Thanks so much for participating in this conference. Hello. Thanks for having me. So, Mark, I'd like to start just, you know, with the beginning of your work, good place to start, I suppose, uh, with Yoga Body. And, and you know, obviously, many people who are um, tuning into this conference will have heard of Yoga Body, whether or not they read it is another question. But it certainly has made a huge splash, you know, as you, as, as we know, in non-academic circles, especially in the yoga community. So, you know, just in case there are those who are tuning in who are not familiar with the book, would you mind just starting off by giving us a short summary of its thesis? Sure. The book is based on uh, the premise that in recent times yoga has uh, traveled and developed in very particular ways, culturally specific ways, that from, let's say, the mid-19th century, yoga starts to leave India and to travel around the world in a kind of process that, that we see very much still at work today. Uh, and that in that process, uh, you also find adaptation and innovation and different kinds of um, disciplines of mind, of body and of spirit, let's say, uh, becoming associated with yoga in quite uh, sometimes unprecedented ways. Um, so that's, that's the premise. And the, the main focus of, uh, of the book Yoga Body is what one scholar has, has uh, called modern postural yoga. It's a term that you'll hear uh, fairly frequently now. That's Elizabeth de Michaelis in her typology of, of different kinds of, uh, of modern yoga. Uh, and modern postural yoga is the kind of yoga that is characterized by um, asana practice, where asana posture practice is, uh, if, if not the only, then uh, probably the primary mode of, of yoga practice. And so in Yoga Body, the, the thesis is that postural practice has developed in quite specific ways in recent decades, particularly at the beginning of the 20th century, when there was a wider um, movement to popularize yoga and not to globalize yoga to make yoga available in uh, kind of democratic uh, accessible ways and posture postural yoga was reformulated during that time in certain hands in order to make it uh, more accessible in order to make it more understandable so the frames uh, and through which people understood yoga were um, were quite different, let's say, than than they might have been in uh, uh, three hundred years previously in a traditional yoga pra practicing uh, context. Right. And so the, the book is really um, a an examination of that kind of cultural history, how and why it is that um, that your, the posture practice and yoga more generally has changed. Uh, who were the who were the people that were um, reviving it or giving it new colors or a new spin and uh how did it one, one of the sort of secondary questions is how did we get here how did we get to this place where we are today where yoga is such a household name and also where um yoga is so predominantly associated with asana practice as it wasn't arguably uh, mm -hmm. primarily in in the ancient past let's say mm -hmm. 
Um, so, you know, as we, as we mentioned, this, this text, which, you know, originally was intended to be an academic test, text, mainly has become, you know, widely embraced by um, particularly the yoga community. Were you surprised by that popularity or did you sort of anticipate it? Yes, I was, um, I was, su I'm surprised. I'm still surprised by how, um, <laughs> uh, how, how frequently it, it seems to be, it seems to be cited and, and um, how often people seem to be aware of its existence, um, mm. even if, if they haven't read it and, and how sometimes um, people, even if they haven't read it, have, have quite strong opinions about, uh, <laughs> yes. about its contents. Um, yeah. So it, it was an academic thesis. However, it's an academic thesis that is on a topic that's, that's very popular. Right. Um, it, sometimes it seems like everybody practices yoga, or if they don't, they, they will next year. They intend to, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, everybody has, it's, uh, it's on their New Year's resolution. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, and that popularity, uh, as you say, it's like people have strong opinions, whether one way, one way or another, and, and it, the text seems to have been, and as you point out in, your, in this really interesting and refreshing you know, uh, if I can say it, uh, call it that, or introduction to the Serbian addition to Yoga Body, in which you talk about the way it's been kind of appropriated by a number of different agendas, some that celebrate the book and some that, you know, uh, have a lot of criticisms of the book. But a lot of this, you know, co-optation has been, hinges upon what you say are, you know, pervasive misunderstandings and misinterpretations of what your intentions were and also you know really the 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 nuances of the thesis so um can you talk a little bit about um you know what those misunder misinterpretations have been well some of the most common are that um i'm claiming that that yoga was a, a recent invention right um or more specifically, that um, that asanas have been invented in recent times, um, <laughs> and I think partly that arises due to the the subtitle of the book, which is the origins of modern posture practice. Yeah. But what I'm doing, in fact, is describing contexts in which postures, which may or may not have existed before, uh, are given new interpretations, are given new uses, and are played out, are practiced in in different settings. And so, <clears throat> if one wishes to see, um, as, as many do, you know, a sort of an argument about origins. Yeah. Um, of course, that's a hot political potato. Um, right. Then one's going to focus on, on the fact that, of course, you know, asanas aren't new. Of course, they aren't invented. Um, and so the, the, uh, lots of the, uh, the responses that I saw to the book were... Uh, were sort of attacking it on those terms, so it, as a kind of a, a straw man, I suppose. Yeah. Um, saying that, well, you know, obviously it, it's not invented, but that's not a, a word that I use to this process in the book, um, apart from um, where I'm, I'm citing uh, Dharma Mitra, a, a New York based uh, yoga teacher who says that every day people are inventing new postures. So th there is, um, that is a place where misunderstanding can occur. And which I think has also raised very um, interesting questions that maybe we'll, we'll do later about the, the politics of yoga and also yeah. the, the position that scholarship um, situates, it, situates itself in with, with regard to that, that kind of those political tensions. Um, another, um, say the, the, the kind of converse of that is, um, an idea that, that what I've done is to show that uh, because there is a, a measure of adaptation and um, innovation uh, and, and great change sometimes within yoga itself and the, and the way that it's practiced, um, is to say that uh, yoga is entirely up for grabs, that it's, right. uh, you can take it and you can run with it, you can do what you want with it. Um, and it'll still be yoga because change is not only, um, you know, characteristic of the modern period, but um, as, as I think I, I also say in, in that book, it's very much characteristic of uh, the yoga traditions as, as a whole. Things change and things adapt. And that's something, you know, in, in, a, in the roots of yoga that, that we see very clearly, this, this kind of adaptation. So the, those two, it's sort of, it's odd 
the, the book has been taken to support very, very different agendas. One that would um, innovate and, and create afresh and, um, and sort of take yoga away from those, uh, those earlier contexts. And one uh, that, that really would, would sort of, you know, take, take it as a, um, uh, as a means to assert those origins and the hold that they, that they, uh, that they should have and the influence that they should have on practice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to sort of reiterate what you just um, said, you you know, you remark in the in the introduction that that these misinterpretations lead to two conclusions: one, that we need to get rid of modern bastardized forms of yoga and return to the roots, um, which is sort of you know that's more or less what I have found <clears throat> is the common refrain. And and usually it's not even that we need to return to its roots; it's just sort of like this isn't yoga, you know, modern yoga isn't yoga. Let's call it something else modern calisthenics, whatever, and just throw, you know, completely throw it out. And then the second conclusion, um, you know, as you mentioned, is that since yoga is a construct that it's there for the, for the reinventing, which I wasn't quite as familiar with. I wasn't quite as familiar with that one. I it feel, it feels to me like, um, at least what we see here, um, at least in the New York yoga scene, it's usually, this book is usually used as like, uh, uh, as you mentioned, that it wasn't supposed to be interpreted as, as, a, as a means to debunk modern yoga or to bust the myth of modern yoga in that, in that way. And so I want to read a quote that you wrote because, again, this could just be sort of um, uh, rehashing what you just said, but I really like the, the, the quote here. So, um, for example, if one frames the modern physical culture movement as the origin of popular global hatha yoga practice in the early 20th century, one invites the predictable and with certain qualifications correct counter argument that such practice originates, in fact, in Indian traditions of hatha yoga. If one instead frames modern physical culture as one, albeit vital, context in which certain varieties of early 20th century hatha yoga flourished, one finds oneself on rather different ground, where it becomes possible to appreciate that a multiplicity of contexts have contributed to the nexus of embodied meanings that find expression in this hatha yoga, including, without a doubt, pre-modern forms of hatha, but also and crucially including modern physical culture. The first frame in invites polarized and, to my mind, sterile right versus wrong debates. The second, on the other hand, maintains the possibility of an ongoing collective scholarly adumbration of yoga's contexts in all their social, cultural, and historical complexity, <clears throat> end quote. So I, I, what I really like about this quote, you know, and what I feel like you're really offering in this introduction is that you know, it's it's a lot more nuanced than that. It's not a it's not an either or. It's more of a both and, and that there's nothing that <clears throat> frustrates you know that destabilizes the identity of yoga in uh, by pointing out that there is a kind of disjunction. There is a, a, a moment of a renaissance in its history. Can you talk a little bit about why people feel so? Um, uh, uh, strongly about the need to see a kind of continuous historical trajectory without disjunction? Yes, I, I think the motivations are, are different um, for, for different people. And, and here, you know, I'm, I'm only speculating, really, um, as I you know, yeah. look into people's uh, psyches. Um, but I, I imagine that, um, well, the uh, the sense that that yoga has kind of run away from um, its its sort of you know cultural uh, cultural home or has sort of you know come come loose of its cultural moorings and has been has been taken in a way that that to um, many people who who belong to cultural contexts in which yoga is traditionally practiced find quite alarming um, that. With within that, um, that from that perhaps comes comes an impulse an impulse to insist on the the integrity of yoga and and the sameness of yoga because what we see is in some respects fission almost you know that like a, a just a proliferation of yogas that that um, I was going to say increasingly have have less to do with you know with that tradition but that that's not true it's more complicated than that but which often have um you know a, a very far from uh from yoga's cultural origins uh and so i imagine that that one response is that to you know to see that and and then from from the other side the other side from practitioners 
um, who are um, who, who don't have who aren't born into or you know don't don't belong to um, a culture or a religion um, that that typically has practiced yoga that has traditionally practiced yoga. Um, perhaps there is there's also um, but but for whom the you know these practices are vital you know that they, they are part of their daily life they're part of the the fabric of of, of their being that you know they're a spiritual path which isn't um you know which, which is which needs to be authentic um and sometimes that authenticity is associated with um a kind of purity of origins yeah um it's associated with uh you know a a, a long tradition which has its has its roots in in India, um, and so to, in some respects, disrupt that kind of narrative um, with the idea that that yoga can be multiple or that, that it can that it has always changed and grown, and in fact, different yogas have have been in conflict with each other, um, is to complicate. Um, perhaps what's perceived as as a as quite a simple need for for a you know. For an authenticity identified as um, uh, as a kind of a purity, of, as a kind of purity of lineage, or something right. like that. Right. Right. Yes. So, y y in one in your introduction, you admit at one point that the first chapter of Yoga Body, which offers a schematic overview mm -hmm. of the quote Indian tradition, actually has turned out to be um, an inaccurate picture based on recent developments in the historical research. So, can you talk about those inaccuracies a little bit? Well. Um, <laughs> just, just to be accurate, I, I, I don't, um, I don't talk about the, I don't think I, I, I have to check. I, I don't think I talk about the accuracy of the research. But I, I, I'm talking about it being incomplete and okay. Un, 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 That's my my semantic mistake there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what what it is, you know, is it's. I, I think in in some respects that chapter shouldn't be there at all. It, it would make things um, less. Uh, less problematic, but but right. the, the the problem with the construction of that chapter is that the rest of the book is about a fairly defined and narrow um, historical period, you know, about eight, 80 years, 100 years, uh, and the rest of the book is, is about the rest of yoga's history, so, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, 2,500 years. <laughs> uh, in 30 pages. In, in 30 pages, then probably the shortest <laughs> book. Um, and so, it's um, it's schematic. It doesn't give uh, sufficient attention to to the the broader detail, and it's something that that I've become increasingly aware of um, putting together the roots of yoga between uh, you know sort of over the last sort of five or six years. This uh, this new book, which, which really you know assembles. Um, I think we have about 120 texts of, of yoga that, that sort of come together. Whereas in that book, I'm, uh, you know, I don't go into anything like that detail. So I think, um, and it was it was added at the suggestion of uh, of my um, PhD examiners originally, um, and then it sort of it sort of stayed. Um, so I don't, yeah, I, I think you know, quite possibly there's an argument for taking it out if, if I if I were going to rewrite it. Um, so, but the, the actual, um, what I think is missing from that is a history that's emerged since the book, since the book has been published, um, that's coming out of, well, particularly um, the work of, of my colleagues on a, on a, um, a project called the Hatha Yoga Project, which, which is a, it's a European Research Council funded uh, project for, for five years based at uh, SOAS, the University of London. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, investigating the history and development of, of Hatha Yoga from uh, the 11th century, 10th, 11th century, but you know, up, up to the modern period. Uh, so these these colleagues, um, James Mallinson, who I, I wrote Roots of Yoga with, um, and Jason Birch, have, have really done uh, great work in, in fleshing out this history and showing the, the um, the degree of change and the the, the gradations um, that I don't uh, don't you know take into account in in, in that chapter, um, and so that can that I think can can really expand our, our view. I mean, in, in particular, the the, um, 
the new and emerging history that particularly Jason has worked on um, of uh, the development of, of asana in the period after the, the Hatha Pradipika, the, the sort of locus classicus of, of Hatha Yoga, when, when you know, Hatha sort of came, to get, came together uh, and started to become immensely popular. Um, and after that, that period, so 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, you, you have a kind of um, growth of interest in, in, uh, in postures, whereas earlier texts uh, only describe a handful of postures, typically one or three, um, I think 14, 14 or 15 in, in the Hatha Pradivika, uh, you, you start to see more. Um, so all, all of that, I think, is uh, is would be essential to um, to include in, in our in our broader sense of of how the yoga traditions were developing, um, and th this is one reason why I think the term modern yoga and the term that I've been using, modern postural yoga, are problematic because they tend to uh, they suggest that that the that what defines this period is a break that right. somehow you, you have a watershed between what's um, what's pre-modern and what's modern. Yeah, um, and often often what's invoked is you know science. Um, there's you know the, the colonial encounter, the sort of European. Uh, um, uh, involvement in India and interest in India and the, you know colonialism and that kind of history but actually what we see um, I think we have to that's an that's a that's an unhelpful um, it's an unhelpful paradigm if it's considered to be an absolute paradigm it can help to see certain things if you look at you know sort of um, yoga in colonial India let's say but it doesn't um, for one thing it sort of inevitably that kind of focus makes other things disappear such as um, vernacular yogas that, that were um, popular vernacular yogas that were develop, developing both in a kind of dialogue with um, the Sanskritic tradition but also in dialogue with with those those kinds of modernities that, that I um, focused on in, in yoga body so there's a lot more to be done there you know it's, it's really it's not the whole picture it's just you... it's just one Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with this term ver vernacular yogas. Can you can you define that for us? Oh, I'm just talking about um, um, well, vernacular languages w would be the sort of spoken, used languages right. of of the time in India. So, uh, so-called Hindustani, which which is is given us today. You know, H Hindi and Urdu. Um, Bengali um, and, and so on, you know, Canada, Tamil, um, and, and so on, you know, there, there, are, there are many of them. And they tend to get, they tend to disappear, um, especially if, if one focuses particularly on um, English language texts of yoga and uh, Sanskrit. Uh, yeah. So that you know, an optical illusion uh, sort of <laughs> occurs uh, that, that suggests that those those are the only two things. And when in fact, there's there's really a, a proliferation of work on yoga in uh, in in other languages as well. And particularly this, well, you know, something that I'm especially interested in is the sort of popular popularization of of yoga and the the um, cheap printed uh, sort of do-it-yourself manuals of yoga, which you know, tend to tend to get ignored if, if you're just looking at Sanskrit, which is after all, you know, quite a privileged uh, yeah. register. Right. Or English. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, so what you're saying is that there, there's actually a many, um, you, you said like, essentially like pamphlets uh, that are f of certain yeah. vernacular yogas from, that are, that are that essentially um, distinguish different sort of sub traditions, and that by emphasizing the kind of Sanskrit heritage or the English, we're actually sort of um, marginalizing these smaller forms, or not smaller, right. but you know, less popular forms or less well known. L less well known, yeah, yeah, and um, perhaps not less popular though, because you know, more Who people speak those languages and speak Sanskrit. Yeah, <laughs> or, quite popular in their own context, yeah. <laughs> That's right. So um, 
you know, I mentioned this word before, and and I think that we're actually already talking about this. So again, I might be just you know covering the same territory, but I guess it bears repeating. Um, you describe what's taking place as a renaissance. You bring up this word renaissance, which I really liked mm -hmm. because you were saying let's use this. You essentially like this is a more u useful term because it's an alternative to picturing modern yoga as either an unbroken continuation or a radically inventive departure, and and also you know it seems to just as you're saying uh, that it sort of also can align itself with other renaissances in the the yoga history you know in the history of yoga because you know as you say the invoking kind of the modern as opposed to the pre-modern does this sort of has this effect of kind of implying you know at least those who aren't you know um careful enough about this you know historical conversation it implies that the pre-modern was some kind of continuous trajectory and then the modern is specifically this kind of discontinuous bastardized form so you know um maybe i'm already answering this question but what do you think are the stakes behind seeing it as a renaissance you know rather than this uh, these other ways of speaking mm. about it mm. well um when i i use that that term, I, I think of um, one of the the key figures in in the the recent development of yoga and populariz popularization of yoga, Sri Yogendra, who set up the first kind of modern scientific yoga institute in in 1917 in uh, near near uh, modern day Mumbai, um, and uh, he called what he was doing well the outside outside his institute is a sign that says that this is the home of the, the modern yoga renaissance mm. um, and um yogendra is uh i would say one of the more self-aware of of the of the innovators of you know w within modern yoga he's he sort of he sees that that he's uh changing and adapting things and he's quite clear that he wants to um, and so in, in his hands, I, I, at least his project, I think, can be referred to as a renaissance. He, he, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a new, uh, <laughs> it's a new birth, you know, he's, yeah. he's, um, but he's not, he's not inventing it out of whole cloth. What he's doing is, uh, is looking back to ancient texts, he's looking back to um, uh, older ways of knowing, and fairly, you know, self-consciously sometimes, mostly, um, sort of merging them with with modern technologies, you know, modern forms of of body discipline that he knows because he reads English, and not only does he read and speak English, but he's been to America, um, mm. and he has, you know, sort of um, rubbed shoulders with luminaries like the the Kelloggs, um, you know, the the sort of you know the the healthiest avant-garde, if you like, of, of, of the West Coast. Um, he's given yoga demonstrations, and he's also encountered the Yoga Sutras in mm. New York. So, you know, he, he really is um, in, in this kind of um, dialectical sort of tangled relationship with the out, outside modern world in, in a way that his yogic forebears, let's say, say traditional yogis um, would not be. In, in, to some risk, to, to some degree, remain today. So that would be uh, that's 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 Yogendra. Other um, let's say um, innovators or um, other popularizers of yoga, or, or those whose influence has uh, has changed the course of yoga um, over the past century or so, may not be. Um, quite so ready to admit the um the the influence of, of other kinds of thought and in fact there's there's a there's a um there's there's an ambiguity or it it's quite it's quite difficult to see that i think because when one teaches and especially teaches outside of, of a traditional environment or outside of, of a um of a let's call it a, a restrained or strict doctrinal environment within which yoga would traditionally occur, one is forced um, in some ways to, to adapt uh, pedagogically to, to what, what the audience knows. So if, if we take another example, Sri, um, I'm sorry, um, Swami Vivekananda, yeah. who was um, among, among the first to sort of, um, to bring, well, uh, to, to bring yoga to to America, let's say, and that's a, quite a simplification. But you know, he he enabled a kind of uh, subsequent popular 
popularization of yoga through through his talks and through his books and and um, very much insisted uh, that yoga was had come down to us perfectly delineated I, I think he says you know from 5,000 years ago and that's what we've got that's what we're teaching mm -hmm. and yet at the same time is is quite clearly just like Sri Yogendra um, sort of 30 years after him uh, he is um, he's adapting to his audience who know nothing about next to nothing about India next to nothing about yoga and um, he's fascinated himself by for example, modern psychology and William James. Uh, he's, he's interested in Christian science and Christian science moreover is interested in yoga and William James is interested in yoga. And so um, in cases like that, um, the talking about a, a, a Renaissance might, it, is problematic insofar as the claim by Vivekananda is that-, that There is none, is yeah. Never dead. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. the same. it's the same lifespan that, that's never been broken. Mm, mm. So, you know, you describe in, um, in that introduction mm -hmm. that I keep referring to, uh, you describe your relationship with yoga practice as a participant experiencer, rather than, you know, what is becoming a, a more common designation um, as a scholar <clears throat> practitioner. So I'm wondering, you know, what the difference for you is between these two perspectives. Well, I've, I've borrowed this term um, participant experience from an anthropologist called Elizabeth Sue, HSU, from a 2006 um, chapter that she wrote um, reflecting on her life as an anthropologist and mm -hmm. her early, um, her early, I, I think her um, graduate research on acupuncture in China. And she decided that um, she could get a fuller understanding of acupuncture and, and the way it was taught uh, and the embodied experience of, um, of being an acupuncturist by actually going to China and training as, uh, training as one. Yeah. Uh, so unlike, uh, so in, in fact, th there's, there's, there's multiple positions here. It's not, it's, you know, um, what, what, that what she's contrasting that with is the term participant observer, which is a you know a co common term in uh, in anthropology, um, where one sort of goes along, you know, and and uh, and watches the, the the sort of you know the the um, I, I don't know the, the technique or the, or the people that, that one is one is interested in, um, but has has this sort of relationship of. Um, perhaps of distance where you know it's the, there's the the seeing gaze um whereas here she's talking about a, a kind of bodily and experiential uh, involvement which you know is, is problematic uh is problematic in its own terms um but which she argues gives gives her a greater understanding uh, which is inevitably when uh considering um when when one's topic is 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 an embodied um knowledge like acupuncture or arguably yoga that 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 sort of thing allows allows one to um, that sort of involvement allows one to understand more deeply um and that, that you know say amplifies um one's knowledge of, of of that area um much more than let's say just textual study could and so um i i think what i'm talking about when, when I use that term is, is the fact that, um, um, well, I, I practiced yoga for a long time and I, I practiced and still do. Um, and, and so and it seems to me that that, that is, is quite important um, as, a, um, as a means to understand a, a, a body of knowledge, and a, um, a body of knowledge and, and a, a knowledge of the body. Um, and I, I haven't, I mean, I haven't gone into this much. I'm, I'm actually working on an article um, at the moment on, on, on these topics. But just to, to go back to your, your question of how, how you distinguish these two things, um, the first one, the participant experiencer would be a methodological decision for, for let's say, an anthropologist going in, into the, the, the field. The second one, um, the scholar practitioner of yoga, um, I think I, I use that to describe um, 
a number of contributors to a book that I edited with Jean Byrne in 2008 called um, Yoga in the Modern World. Uh, and to sort of begin perhaps to problematize this, uh, um, this ambiguity and, and this range of positions that, that people take with regard to their um, scholarship and with regard to their own practice um, that, that you know, could, could be sort of um, put under the rubric of scholar practitioner or indeed practitioner scholar. So the, I'll, I'll come back to that, that second part in a moment, but the, the scholar practitioner of yoga is um, roughly speaking somebody who does yoga and also um, uh, thinks and writes about it and speaks about it in an academic environment. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> now, the, there's a, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of gradations there, and yeah. um, it can be it it has typically been that um, scholars who write about yoga will often mask their um, practitioner status. So, a, right. a very good example of that would be. Um, uh, Mircea Eliade, who wrote mm. Yoga, Immortality and Freedom, you know, which was the, the sort of defining um, uh, book of yoga scholarship for so long. Um, and he, he, wrote about, he wrote about yoga practice in his fiction, sort of fictionalized autobiography, but kept it very hidden. And it seems to me that, that that's something quite interesting also, also to explore, that dynamic, that tension between being a scholar and being a practitioner, where um, being a practitioner somehow diminishes one yeah. as, a, as a scholar. And I've, I've experienced that myself as a, um, at the beginning of my graduate studies, I, I remember I presented a, a paper to a, a, this uh, senior seminar in, in Cambridge um, and delivered ahead of time a, a, a biography which mentioned that, that I was also a practitioner of yoga. And the professor who was introducing me spontaneously edited that out and I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's that's telling it's probably <clears throat> what he was doing was uh, in some sense he thought he was doing me a kindness because to right. you know admit that one is a scholar is some, somehow to uh, diminish one's status as, he, as a practitioner yeah I, I wonder if uh, the the senior <laughs> center was also a center with a lot of seniors in, as in senior <laughs> academics and I uh, just because, you know, this emerging form of the scholar practitioner definitely does seem to be something that is uh, more readily adopted by people who are younger. Um, and, and so what stri strikes me in your kind of distinguishing between <clears throat> the participant experiencer and the scholar practitioner is that it seems to me that the participant, participant experiencer is is um, is not is through that kind of engagement is not is not required to kind of surrender the position of objectivity that they're supposed to inhabit, you know, setting aside the question of whether that, you know, objectivity exists. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have to surrender that position in their engagement with the whatever it is that they're researching. Whereas the scholar practitioner seems to have more of a, um, a kind of questionable relationship with that objectivity or, you know, in order to be a practitioner, they they do surrender that and and that there's and that there's something to kind of um i don't know capture or experience from the inside that's only possible when one um gives up that idea of you know standing at some archimedean point outside of reality and uh, you know deducing and adducing from that perspective does that seem right mm -hmm. in in some sense yes i, I think so um <clears throat> It, I mean, it seems to me that the, these are these are questions that that occur mostly within within anthropology and and social sciences. Right. Um, one is if if one sort of looks at what you might call hardcore philology, the sort of the textual criticism of of, uh, of Sanskrit texts or um, other language texts. Um, you're much less likely to sort of <laughs> encounter these questions. And um, I, I think there's, there's, a, there's much more of a suspicion. And I think each of those positions has its virtue, virtues. It, it, I suspect that the sort of um, emphasis on positionality can sometimes get a little bit out of hand and, and become, become quite solipsistic. So, so right. that the, you, yeah. you know that that sort of theoretical question becomes the most important thing, but um, perhaps what is what's what's useful, what what 
is most useful is to shuttle back and forth to, to sort of between that you know that that sort of uh, hyper subjectivity or, or that that kind of um, examination of, of, of one's positionality with regard to to the the field of study um, but also also not to let that I, I think become all-encompassing so that the the other work which doesn't involve that and I think needn't involve that um, can, can also go on and, and go on providing um, what are invaluable historical insights and I'm, I'm thinking here of my um, colleagues who who do work in in that philological mode um so I, I i don't know actually i'm i'm still i'm still reflecting on this but it seems like uh, that tension is a good one it's it's not a not one that we should that we should seek to resolve necessarily that, that yeah. both of those positions both of those approaches um and methods yield different yield different results yeah yeah i think it's an interesting conversation and um and i'm eager to read your article about it. is it uh, is it actually about that um that question the the article <clears throat> you mentioned earlier yes it's about the um scholar practitioner of yoga and i'm, I'm writing it with uh with a scholar called borean larius oh excellent and, and we're, we're, uh, you know we haven't written it yet but it's on its way <laughs> it's it's coming okay great well i look forward to it so um you know and i understand i understand that <clears throat> excuse me to a certain extent you know this text was not meant for practitioners not that you know not to imply that practitioners shouldn't read it but it wasn't it was meant to be an academic work um you know and there and there isn't uh, nothing there isn't anything programmatic about it meaning um you know i shouldn't take yoga body onto my yoga mat and then and try to imbibe its principles you know in the experience of my practice but you know what would someone you know who asked you if we were if we had a room full of yogis in here um or yoga practitioner also practitioners who asked you you know if if it has nothing to offer my practice you know how should i relate to it what what would your response be like how how should you know in the, because this book is being offered in teacher trainings and obviously it's interesting just as a historical but is that simply is that the only way we should sort of um relate to it is just as a as a kind of historical text Mm. Well, I suppose that the first thing, the first way that I'd respond to a practitioner who who, um, who said that would be to perhaps encourage them to reflect on or, or broaden or, or perhaps blur their own sense of, of what it is to be a practitioner. Um, are, are they exclusively a practitioner of yoga? Are they a pure, purely a practitioner of yoga, and and what what would a pure practitioner of yoga look like? I mean, surely they're they're also somebody with critical faculties, um, a, a body hopefully. that's used for <laughs> hopefully the, a body that's used for other things than than that practice than the yoga practice. Um, you know, families and friends and careers. Uh, so a, a practitioner is isn't somebody who exclusively practice yoga and, and practices yoga and doesn't do anything else um, so practitioners also reflect and it seems to me important that it, it, it you know that's that's in a reason why 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 i wrote um yoga body why, why i did that research on modern yoga because it seems to me that the recent history is is important and it wasn't important a while ago, it wasn't important to scholars that you know, such as Mircea Eliade that I, that I mentioned, that that history was sort of well, you know, it wasn't real yoga, it wasn't really, um, wasn't really important. You needed to look at the ancient stuff and the philosophical stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that that modern, and I think there's a similar thing perhaps uh, happens within within practitioner circles where you know that that modern history isn't important what we need to know is, is the you know the, the key truths um but that modern history has shaped the way that people practice it, it you know it really has it's shaped the way um, not only the the practices that are that are done because of the particular reception history of yoga in um in the us or in um anywhere you know anywhere in the world um but also because what yoga does how yoga works what yoga gets to is perceived quite differently uh in those contexts that, than it has been and so in order to understand what what one is doing as a practitioner it seems to me that um one needs to have some idea of, of what's happened recently within within yoga history and 
Um, it's interesting, just the, 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 the way your, your question was phrased, you know, the, the sort of, the, that it's non-programmatic um, and, you know, which provoked, provokes the question, well, well what do I do with it then? I, <laughs> I think, you know, to sort of, <clears throat> it seems to me, um, it would seem to me a shame to sort of limit the, <laughs> the sort of yoga genre to, to the programmatic, which, you know, yeah, of course, sort of has been. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the, you know, well, just, just to say finally, you know, sort of opening oneself to, to cultural history, to philosophy, to critical sure. thought and so on, uh, uh, inevitably going to um, sort of cross pollinate with, with the, the practice on the map. Right. So it's sort of, it's almost inviting, you know, practitioners to, to incorporate a new lens of understanding into their practice, which, you know, may not be programmatic, but it's maybe a, a, a different subject position, but, you know, nonetheless, one that is um, interesting and fruitful for the kind of larger identity of being, you know, a practitioner of the practice or practitioner of yoga. So, you know, I want to, there's a few questions I want to get to. We're getting sort of getting close to the end of our time. So I want to kind of <clears throat> squeeze these in um, because they're all good. I was thinking, should I edit one out? But I really want to touch on all of them. So, um, you know, you interestingly mentioned just sort of in passing, you know, you're talking about the constructivist versus the essentialist approach to history. The constructivist meaning, you know, everything is a human artifact where, you know, humans are creating everything, blah, blah, blah. And then the essentialist pro approach, which means no yoga is inherent to reality. It is, it is, there is an essence to yoga that transcends all human um, intervention. So, um, and, and then you say, Actually, you remark that this, these don't have to be immutably, immutably opposed, and you don't mention, you know, the kind of view that would that where that not immutably opposed um, uh, uh, view could exist. So I'm just curious, you know, what you know, this sort of a, just a thought experiment. What would um, uh, someone's kind of you know worldview, a practitioner's worldview, look like that could include both that you know that there are human that aspects of the practice are human artifacts while also maintaining this idea of kind of an essential yoga that has something to say about the essence of reality or whatever yeah well um i'm not sure how useful the, these two terms are i think i was just i was using them to um to sort of highlight um <clears throat> a kind of a conflict that, that sometimes occurs um in debates about yoga, you know, wh whether whether yoga is immutable, such as, you know, as, as I was uh, mentioning Swami Vivekananda earlier, or, or whether whether it's a human artifact, whether it's been put together um, and has developed on account of human invention and ingenuity, right? Broad, broadly defined. Um, <clears throat> so those the, those would be the hard position you know that what i what i i think i said in, in that preface the sort of hard positions that yoga never changes it's always been there everything um that that we see in yoga's history was already there and typically um well <clears throat> one uh, particular uh sort of um answer to that is is that uh, yoga occurred first in the Vedas, and the Vedas themselves are, are, not, uh, are not constructed, they're not human, they were always right. already there. Yeah. Um, and and all, all yogas are found in the Vedas, and that, that would be an, an orthodox, well, perhaps, um, you know, what we might call an orthodox Hindu point of view, or, you know, some uh, people do argue, argue that. Or, you know, you, you might say the same thing about tantras, which, um, uh, sometimes position themselves in opposition to the Vedas, but nonetheless sort of hold, hold a similarly authoritative, um, authoritative um, position. So, so um, those would be, that would be the sort of, you know, hard, hard constructivist position and, and the, you know, I'm sorry, essentialist position. And, the, you know, constructivist, as, as you said, would, would oppose that saying, no, essentially everything is human. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we, in, it, we're going to consider uh, everything in those terms, historically or um, uh, anthropologically or, you know, whatever the frame is. Um, but th those positions can soften. And uh, so you can have um, sort of <clears throat> agnostic constructivists who, who admit a kind of um, um, perhaps a, a kind of 
essential truth that runs through um, um, historical mutability, or yeah. through, you know, through historical change. That, that actually, well, yes, somebody might it might come up with a new way of doing something or, or a new sort of understanding, um, but they. Um, uh, yes, but but that that doesn't necessarily challenge this sort of inner inner essence or inner core, um, and and similarly um, the the essentialist might you know well recognise that uh, well actually yes things, things uh, you know that we can see it from 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 these texts that things have changed that people have come up with new ideas, uh, and that 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 there has been development. So that that's all I meant really. That's that that you know there, there can be a kind of perhaps a mutual agnosticism between the, those two. Um, theoretical, you know, hard, hard positions. I see. Okay. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> I want to talk now a little bit about, and then we'll sort of, we'll end on question of, you know, where your research is headed and maybe we can reflect a little bit on, um, on Roots of Yoga, but I, I do want to squeeze in this conversation around the political, which of course is a very um, important question and, and pressing question right now. Um, and you, so you mentioned, you know, at the end of your introduction to the Serbian edition about the, the influence of Hindutva, which we've covered a lot um, um, uh, on the, the podcast Chitheads, which we host at Embodied Philosophy, uh, which is a conservative Hindu movement, um, which, you know, I, I find really interesting and ironic that it gains a kind of support from certain leftist considerations of identity politics and questions of cultural appropriation. So we have this kind of like in the West liberal, you know, concern that then is kind of coupled with what is in, you know, in, from some perspective, a kind of, you know, radical conservative movement, which is sort of an interesting paradox. But anyway, um, so can you talk about the imp impact of Hindutva that Hindutva has had on these conversations. I know I have seen, you know, even in some of our programs, you know, if a white face is teaching something that is, is quote yoga, we get like, we are, there's always a few trolls that are saying, I would, you know, I'd be interested in this if it wasn't for this white face, as if, you know, the teachings are just inherently soiled by a Westerner, you know, touching this, what is considered to be, you know, um, only um, a, a, a Hindu's um, domain. So. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, um, on this conversation around Hindutva and and sort of the the problems that it poses for scholarship and also just for practice. Well, there you have it, friends. Sorry to leave it there, but if you want to hear Mark's answer to that question as well as to hear a little bit more about the future of Mark's research, then be sure to register for Yoga Reconsidered, our next online conference, which is airing February 16th to the 18th, 2018. You can register for Yoga Reconsidered at embodiedphilosophy.courses forward slash yoga reconsidered. Again, that's embodiedphilosophy.courses forward slash yoga reconsidered.